All right, well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, American Institute for Philosophical and Cultural Thought. My name is John Shook, and I'm the president. We have the other two directors of the Institute here with us, Randall Oxier and Larry Hickman. Welcome, good to see you. Uh, the American Institute for Philosophical and Cultural Thought uh, fosters the study of philosophical and cultural thought in America, and uh, we collect this is an archive and a library. We provide access to these resources to all sorts of visiting researchers, both domestic from here in America and international around the world. Uh, we have approximately 25 to 30,000 books, we're not clear, uh, under this one roof, and uh, collections of papers as well. And uh, we can host workshops and seminars like this one tonight fairly frequently. Uh, this space is also available for various kinds of receptions and musical events and other sorts of events of interest to the community and the academic community nearby at the Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. We also have a resident fellowship program. Do we have any fellows here with us well, presently? Paul Sherlin. <laughs> Myron Jackson is here with us, so good to see you folks. Uh, we believe that this institute has opened and is operating at a crucial time for humanities in America. Uh, there is a growing neglect for the humanities across institutions of higher education in America, and there is a, a widespread tendency, we worry, uh, to neglect uh, humanistic learning in our culture, and uh, we fear that it's getting worse and worsening. So. We are in defiance of that uh, pessimism here. This is a, an act of bold optimism. And uh, so we decided to create a home, uh, a community for humanistic thinking and learning. And we are devoted to conserving and conveying that treasure of, of inherited values and achievements on into the future. So we're glad to have you here, and uh, we regard uh, events such as these as a very good sign that there remains to be continued interest in uh, humanistic thought, philosophical thought, and American culture. Uh, it, it, it is still alive and well, and uh, we can treasure it and pass it on. So the next person who is going to speak is Randall Oxier, who will do some further introductions. Thank you very much for being here. This is a cookie. This cookie was paid for by the Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity. In addition to this cookie, however, the Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity has sponsored this spring conference for um, uh, creativity, and in particular this year's spring conference, this is the first year, we're going to do it for at least three years, but possibly beyond that, um, was Creativity, Pragmatism, uh, and Logic. And so we've had uh, an afternoon of uh, papers on the topics of creativity, pragmatism, and logic. And the Central Society for the Philosophy of Creativity, which is being re restarted as of this evening with this ceremonial cookie, um, <laughs> uh, is, is, is going to be having a spring conference every year here. The Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity has partnered with the AIPCT um, for lots of different programming, including a summer dissertation fellowship. The first one was this past year. We've got another one uh, coming up this summer, uh, and that has been a very successful program. The Han Lectures, the fourth of which was this past summer, and the fifth one will be this next summer, Ken Stickers will be our Han lecturer, and I look forward to a full day of activities associated with that. And on into the future, the Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity intends to interact with AIPCT and to promote the study of creativity, especially the philosophical study of creativity. Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity and its associated societies, Pacific Division, Eastern Division, this one, 
was started in 1957 by William S. Minor, who was a professor of communication studies at SIU, a rhetoric professor essentially, but the philosophy of communication was his specialty. And those societies have carried out important research and have facilitated important research now for 62 years. And so uh, we intend to continue that and we intend to continue it here. And so it's natural given that the, these foundation, the foundation and these societies were started at SIU Carbondale that they should continue to be based here and continue to do their programming here. Uh, okay, so. welcome back. Our next speaker is John Shook. He is at the University of Buffalo and a co-founder of this institute author of uh, numerous books, articles on pragmatism, naturalism, logic, what have you, more than can be recounted here. And the <laughs> talk, if I've got this right, is Abduction and the Logic of Scientific Creativity. So, John, you mm -hmm. Thank you. So there's a handout, and for folks viewing on the YouTube channel, how y'all doing? <laughs> the, what's on the handout is going to appear on the slides in the sequence as we go. So, on the handout, we're starting with what looks like this on this side, and uh, corresponds to the first slide up above. So, let me say that I've been working on abduction and scientific realism. <coughs> the occasion of this conference on creativity led me to think about uh, where scientific creativity uh, is exhibited in the logic of abduction. And I've had some help from good friends lately who have gotten me thinking about things like community and uh, communities of interpretation. So there's some of that uh, uh, talk in here that I think uh, uh, really helps it out. Scientific creativity is not mere novelty. The history of science does not amount to just a sequence of novel but loosely related ideas. Hypotheses do arise over time, but a scientific field enlarges with discoveries based on discoveries. To be scientific, worthy discoveries are justifiably accepted. The culmination of scientific creativity cannot stop short of appreciation and adoption into the growing body of scientific knowledge. Creative speculations can arise easily. But creating knowledge is difficult, and rightly so. How is knowledge of the world created? Here, at that creation, what is learnable and what is logical must be integrated and unified. So I claim. Since knowledge of the world is created, something in this world has to accomplish that unification. Or maybe not. Knowledge of this world may need something not of this world. <laughs> Discovery and justification could fall on separate sides of that divide. Where discovery happens may not be where justification is. This means that learning and logic are kept apart. Creativity could be torn apart. Maybe there is imaginative creativity and also logical creativity. Or perhaps creativity is forced to choose sides, in which case the side of learning claims creativity. That sounds like a valid enough claim. Intuition, inspiration, imagination, by whatever name, a burst of creativity seems very different from the cold inferential steps and strict reasoning. Now, science itself knows almost nothing about this. Science is at least in its own words, only about this world. Where in the world is reasoning? Now, psychology would offer a reductionist solution if logic is just logical reasoning and logical reasoning amounts to cognitive habits. You see where this goes. You could reduce it to psychology or something like that. Now, philosophy has long-standing resistance to that worldly reduction. And philosophy has a long-standing temptation towards a dualistic solution. And then philosophy of science just inherited the whole question. For example, philosophy of science still distinguishes the context of discovery from the context of justification. Logical empiricism, one thinks of Karl Popper, even dichotomize them.
But the downfall of that kind of empiricism did not doom the distinction as well. An initial conception is different from a final conclusion. Imagining ideas to inspire learning looks like one process, while justifying learning to count as knowledge is another different process. That division of labor still separates learning apart from logic. The history of science, for example, uses this distinction. One scientist gets credit for first imagining a hypothesis, while another scientist is credited with later confirming that hypothesis. But everybody knows science stopped being that simple long ago. Philosophers from William Huell in the mid-19th century to Larry Loudon in the late 20th century noticed how the genesis of a hypothesis has receded in significance as theoretical models have become more complex and resemble observable things less and less. The large role for an individual scientist has also diminished. Behind a complex hypothesis, there stands a large number of scientists who developed it over time, and teams of scientists are needed for gathering confirmations of that hypothesis. Furthermore, those two processes have more and more in common as science grew more complex. The period of development overlaps and often gets involved with the period of confirmation. Some scientists help to redevelop hypotheses while they simultaneously participate in designing rounds of experimental trials of those hypotheses. A growing body of scientists consult together about the eventual rejection or acceptance of a hypothesis contributing to the body of knowledge either way. Perhaps discovery and justification are supposed to be organically unified during the creation of knowledge. That would be the non-dualistic option. If learning and logic are integrated in that common role of knowledge creation, creativity could not be isolated from reasoning. Each would find its scientific purpose in the other. Creativity would be reasonable. Reasoning would be creative. Where a body of scientists are growing a body of knowledge. Dualism, on the other hand, completely dismembers that organic unification. It divides discovery from justification with novel creativity on one side, logical reasoning on the other. Scientific creativity, therefore, remains a problem where the relationship between learning and logic is a problem. However, the resolution of one would be the solution for the other. Now, philosophy of science is at least convinced that there's a logic of justification. And in itself, logical justification is not so problematic. Science itself sets its standards for reasonable inference to test and justify accessible, acceptable hypotheses. On the other hand, the idea of a logic of discovery in isolation is much harder to conceptualize, and maybe it should be. Logic can lead to learning. We can at least agree on that. For example, deductive logic yields some learning. Deductive inference allows a reasoner to discover propositions not previously known. Deduction leads to conclusions of propositional learning about the terms in the premises. Our question, however, is whether deduction leads to discovery. Although a reasoner learns propositions that are new to that learner, only propositions are discovered. The terms of the conclusion are not new and, in fact, cannot be new to the reasoner since the premises must first be understood. Novelty to a term's meaning is unwanted. Since a term's meaning should not change between premises and the conclusion, terms must not change meanings if more premises are added. Through deduction, a term is not discovered, nor is a term's meaning discovered or altered. In most, propositional learning adds relations among already understood terms. Deduction about empirical matters adds some further restrictions. For example, a learner accepting a conclusion as known already accepts the premises as accurate, and accepting an empirical premise involves taking its terms to be about existing matters. Learning an empirical conclusion by deduction is not about discovering a premise term or discovering that a premised thing exists. Nothing in the world is discovered during deductive reasoning. So now we come to slide one. It's also up here. Induction and abduction offer more opportunities for learning and discovery. And we're going to use purse as a jumping off point here. Purse refers to deductive necessity, inductive probability, and abductive expectability, which are interesting ways of putting it. Purse says that only abduction allows 
for scientific explanation. And here are three oft quoted site, uh, uh, things from Peirce at different points. Take, for example, the third one. Abduction is the process of a forming new explanatory hypotheses. It is the only logical operation which introduces any new idea. Now, to be clear, Peirce also says that ultimately only perception is the origin for genuinely new conceptions. But Peirce here is talking about uh, the context of uh, uh, explanatory hypotheses in the context of scientific inquiry. So perception, though, gets ultimate credit. So let's compare them a little more here. These are now my claims, but they are based on Peirce. Deduction does not seek more premises. You can add them, but deduction itself is a logical operation that's content with whatever premises are already given. Deduction cannot change the meaning of terms during reasoning, and deduction cannot discover the existence of anything. By contrast, induction can seek more premises, and in fact it should. That's the point of further exploration, to add to the validity of uh, uh, confirming an induction. Uh, uh, inductive conclusion. Repetitive induction can change the meaning of terms during reasoning. I'll give some examples. But induction, notoriously, cannot discover the existence of anything either. That credit goes to abduction. Abduction should seek out more premises. We're going to give some examples. Abduction would, and I would claim should, change the meanings of terms during the process of abductive reasoning, and abduction, according to Peirce at least, and we'll see, can discover real things. Furthermore, what I'm going to be calling iterative abduction, Peirce invented it and we're going to explore it, can raise the level of reasonable confidence in those things. In other words, the point of abduction is to actually kind of think that the hypothesized entities are real, not just hypothetically. So let's take a look more closely at three examples. Deduction is atemporal. The premises are held together in the mind at the same time. Fruits from that tree are red. These fruits are from that tree. Therefore, these fruits are red. It's a necessary conclusion granting the premises. Induction can be put in an atemporal fashion as well. These fruits are from that tree. These fruits are red. Therefore, fruits of that tree are probably red. And there's a temporal version to induction that uh, is psychologically a little bit more compelling than just its atemporal version. These small fruits are from that tree. Oh, let's look at these fruits more closely. Those three fruits are also red. Well, that's interesting. So let's look at these four. Now let's get four more. So now we have a total of seven. These small red fruits are from that tree too. And these fruits are also sweet. Okay. These five, let's get five more. These small red sweet fruits are from that tree too. Hey, and they're also soft. You see where this is going. So we're by this uh, uh, temporal process of induction, gathering more and more evidence, um, we're uh, making it more and more plausible that they've really got to come from that tree. Right? What are the odds that they're going to be from you know, some very different tree? The, the odds are getting very small. But notice with this temporal version of induction, our conception of that tree's fruits has altered, right? We're gathering a more complex conception of what fruit of that tree means, right? By the end of it, they're small, red, soft, sweet, right, and so forth. So induction can do that, and it's supposed to do that. So let's look at versions now of abduction, first an atemporal and then a temporal before we go on to a more complex version. The atemporal version is the way uh, Peirce usually gives it when he just wants to give a simple version. These are red fruits. That tree's fruit is red. If these fruits are from that tree, then they're red. That's your hypothetical, right? Which you have to have as a premise in your abduction. Therefore, these red fruits are from that tree. Now, we could do a temporal version. It would be similar to the inductive version we just talked about. The first one is surprising. These are small and red fruits. Oh, I wonder where they came from, right? Now that tree over there, their fruit is small and red. If these fruits are from that tree, they are small and red. So some plausibility is already arising. Our suspicion is attaching to that tree. So let's look again. What else is it about these fruit? Well, these small red fruits are also sweet. 
Well, let's go back and check what's going on with that tree. That tree's fruits are also sweet, right? Therefore, these fruits are from that tree. And we can keep doing this, right? Um, but for space sake, I stopped at two, two examples. Now let's combine all of these features, what I call them inductively temporal. So this takes time in the mind because we're looking at the tree, we're looking at the fruit, we're looking at the tree again, we're looking more closely at the fruit, right? We're going back and forth. So there are multiple abductions in a sort of succession building towards the climax of the conclusion. These are red fruits. Hey, that tree has some red fruit. If those fruits came from that tree, they would be red. Okay, so our suspicion is attaching to that tree. These same red fruits are also small. Well, that's interesting. Let's check back with the tree. That, was, that tree uh, has small red fruit. If those fruits came from that tree, then they would be small and red. Okay. Well, they're also sweet. You see how this goes, right? So we have multiple hypotheses. And uh, what's happening here along the way is, like in iterative induction, our conception of that tree's fruits is altered. Furthermore, our hypothesis is getting more and more complex, right? And uh, the actual origin of these fruits is now, to use Peirce's term, expected. In other words, our expectation level keeps rising with each successful iteration. It's looking more and more likely that the fruits really did have their origin in that tree. That's, that's what those trees' fruits look like. Okay. Now, the reasoning that's happening here in inductive abduction, and Peirce uses that phrase actually, inductive abduction, but he doesn't get into any more complex forms the way I do, occurs over time in iterated stages. Now notice I've mentioned inductive abduction, but deduction is not left out either. At each stage of inductive abduction, the hypothesis is a little miniature deduction. That's the if then, right? If those fruits came from that tree, then they would be small and red. So really we have all three forms of inference here compressed into this uh, temporal iterative abduction. Gathering more empirical evidence modifies the conception of the conclusion's object. Where did the fruit come from, right? And it develops the hypothesis along the way. Now, I have a general term for this. It's called procedural abduction. The dynamic relationship between the growing evidence and the developing hypothesis is, I claim, and I believe Peirce believed this as well, is the basis for the realism that arises from a successful procedural abduction. It simply becomes more and more credible that the hypothesized object exists. In this case, the origin of the fruit from that tree. This is a discovery from a reasoning procedure. Now, as interesting as this is, let's get back to our original question. Can anyone tell where the logic and the learning are artificially divided and kept apart? And that's supposed to be a rhetorical question. You're supposed to have a very hard time doing this, which is, I think, an excellent clue to the resolution of the main puzzle we're interested in here. Peirce himself expected that the three kinds of inference should cooperate in learning. His 1903 Harvard Lectures on Pragmatism says, abduction merely suggests that something may be, its only justification is that from its suggestion, deduction can draw a prediction, which then can be tested by induction, and from that, if we are ever to learn anything or understand any phenomenon at all, it must be by abduction that this is to be brought about. He expected the three modes of inference to work together, so I took that as a clue. He occasionally refers to these as mixed inferences, and I have another long quote that I'm going to spare you from his Carnegie application uh, for his logic research of 1902. He goes into this some more. So let's move on. Now, Peirce didn't explore further combinations of mixed inferences. Um, in a published uh, paper, of which I have copies here, there are many possible combinations of deduction, induction, and abduction. Um, there are at least 25 combinations worth investigating from the pseudoscientific to the proto-scientific to the fully scientific. I will spare you all of that, but that is in a, a published paper. Would somebody, uh, what's the exact title of the big paper? Remind me again. Abduction, it's Complex Inferences, and Emergent Heuristics of Scientific Inquiry. Okay, I hope, the, I hope the microphone picked that up. But 
Um, maybe at the end I'll repeat it. All right, so let's move on. I'm only going to give a few combinations. All right. One, uh, the first one is uh, abducibly deductive induction, or what I call retrodicted induction. Uh, what are cues? Cues are now patterns of phenomena. It's like discovering red cherries. And then R's would be, oh, red and sweet cherries or something like this. So the, the, the Q's, R, and S's are the, are the phenomenon we want to explain. A, again, using Peirce's notation, is the hypothesized object. So Q's show up. Now, supposing that if A, uh, then Q's. But we sort of leave A just vague, uh, which is convenient because when R's show up next, we say, oh, well, well uh, A would have predicted R's. So this is sounding good, right? And then S's show up. If you have a sufficiently vague conception of A, you can right, pull out of that hat uh, you know, explanations for, you're, you're sort of retrodicting. It's very convenient. It's not a fully scientific uh, procedure. It, it's, it's a little pseudoscientific. In fact, several pseudosciences rely on exactly this. They keep the conception of A so vague that you know, it can explain anything if you're if you're uh, now, it, it looks superficial, uh, superficially like abductive uh, procedure, but it's actually inductive uh, logically. That's part of the problem. Uh, A's definition is left vague or even designed in advance to explain lots of other things. So, uh, so, but nevertheless, it is one of the many possible combinations of induction, deduction, and abduction. So let's move on to a more complicated um, one, what I call predicted abduction. Technically, it's deduced inductive abduction. Uh, so we get a series of uh, abductions. If A's, then Q's. But we're still dealing with a vague conception of A. But nevertheless, uh, that pattern of Q's does get discovered. So this is not retrodiction. This is prediction, which, of course, is cognitively more persuasive. We actually managed to predict something, and, uh, and successfully so, without knowing that it already existed. And we can sort of keep doing this, and there is a kind of realism that will cognitively emerge. Unfortunately, um, it's not fully scientific because, of course, there are many other possible explanations for the same phenomena. A would have competition. Here's an example. Um, in my neighborhood, garbage cans have been overturned, containers are busted into, food left outside is disappearing. I think it's a bear visiting my neighborhood, but I don't know a lot about bears. Nevertheless, my suspicion gets stronger every day that a mess is discovered outside because that's apparently just what a bear would do. You see the problem here. It's, it's, it's not fully convincing, but cognitively it, has, it, it can make an impression. So what we need is an even more sophisticated uh, version of uh, um, abduction. This is uh, inducibly deductive abduction, or what I call predictable coduction. Um, but now we don't want to let A be so vague. It was the vagueness of A that was causing a lot of the... The, the suspicion, you know, that it's got a lot of competition and it's too easy to pull out of the hat even good predictions. So we're going we're gonna to only adjust A when absolutely necessary. If A, then Q's have feature F1. They have uh, that feature F1. If A, then R's have analogous features F2. But we've only adjusted A a little bit. And it turns out the Q's have both F2 to and F1, and uh, that seems persuasive. So um, let me give you an example. Actually, I'm going to use uh, Harvey's uh, example of the heart, which you, but it's actually a good one um, uh, from physiology. So for example, the heart long ago was connected to the flow of red blood. If the heart by definition rhythmically puts red blood out through the arteries for consumption by the body, then further events would be observed. In fact, the ancient Greek physician Galen noticed pulsing red blood from cut arteries, hearts pumping, pumping blood through its chambers uh, during vivisection and so forth. However, Galen's narrow definition for the heart let centuries of subsequent physicians have to ponder out how heart makes red blood, why heart valves restrict blood flow direction, where blue blood comes from, why some arteries are conveying blue blood, many more mysteries. But then Harvey comes along. He changed the definition of the heart just enough 
to be able to predict certain phenomena that then he was able to discover. Um, the heart doesn't make blood. Blood isn't consumed, but only transformed as it circulates through the body, out through the arteries, back through the veins, and so forth. So this was, now we're, uh, we're just on the, right, this is proto-scientific. Um, and it was a very helpful modification to uh, conceiving of the heart just enough so as to explain then phenomena that were able to be observable. However, uh, we're still short of fully scientific method because unless strict controls are placed upon modifying A conceptually along the way, A still has vast explanatory fertility in a way that it doesn't deserve. It could even become explanatorily vacuous. At its worst, A still only explains things as they get discovered. But nevertheless, we're, we're pretty close to something that is fully scientific. And I claim that this is the border, what I call strict abduction. It's called deducibly abductive abduction or strict abduction. Um, cues show up, so we say if A has certain uh, capacities or um, uh, uh, features. In other words, C1 is our conception of A, then Q. So, you know, we're, but then we're saying, now suppose if A also has features C1 or C2, then in consequence, we would expect both Qs and Rs, and Rs show up. Now, uh, this is what Peirce really wanted from abduction. Remember his pragmatic maxim, our conception of the object is our conception of the consequences. And that's what's going on here in the, in, at these stages. And so we only gradually modify our conception of A in order to make responsible uh, predictions. And if those predictions turn out true, uh, then we become more and more convinced that this is what's going on. Uh, the example here would be the theory of comets, uh, which fits this strict abduction. During the late 1500s, astronomer Tycho Brahe's observations suggested that comets are celestial, not just atmospheric. Uh, during, uh, due to their observed trajectories, if they're celestial, they would be distant from the Earth. Brahe's parallax measurements indicated, indeed, their immense uh, distance from the Earth and hence their vast size. By 1604, Johannes Kepler added that the sun's rays cause a comet's head to expel a stream of nebular material shining by the sun's light. His idea fit well with the uh, previously overlooked way that a comet's tail always points away from the sun. Um, this celestial naturalistic and causal explanation for comets hasn't essentially changed uh, since, but only supplemented. For example, if comets journey between the planets, their paths must also be affected by the sun. By the late 1600s, Isaac Newton had determined that a comet approaches the sun, swings around behind it, departs away from the sun, uh, explains why it takes a, a parabolic path due to gravity and so forth. Also, Isaac Newton was the one who suggested that a sun, uh, the sun would heat a comet as it gets close to high temperatures. So that's why the head of a comet would be dense and the tail would be vaporous because of the temperatures. Later investigations uh, confirmed those conceptions of a comet. And that basically completes the, the basic theory of comets. So that, that's strict abduction. Now, let me ask my rhetorical question again, and I hope you'll begin to agree with me. Is it so easy to separate the logic from the learning in this strict abduction procedure? I can't see where it's easy to separate them out. So let me also ask, is the conceptual creativity somehow isolated or isolatable to just one portion of this procedure or only to one scientist involved with conducting this procedure over time? And I think our answer is, nah, it doesn't really look that way anymore. Not with strict abduction. You can't do that. Now, while you're pondering those questions, let's attend to certain features of strict abduction. And these are the six things that I want to focus on. Um, first of all, strict abduction and all the forms of abduction more complex that are outlined in the paper uh, that's already been published, but I'm not going to get into here, uh, have these uh, features that I claim are 
uh, making them uh, fully scientific. First of all, strict abduction exercises strict control over modestly modifying the conception of A at each stage. A is kept pretty specific and you just can't let it be so vague. Now, you're not going to eliminate vagueness either. You need, you need some metaphorical you know, stretch, um, but you don't want too much. Uh, at each stage, the conception of A has only one clear definition for the purposes of drawing hypothetical inferences and deductions and set of capacities uh, to uh, uh, you know, produce certain consequences in the observable uh, realm. Only the capacities required to account for the phenomena are, tr are attributed to A. And whatever the definition of A may be, that definition is only permitted to be compatible with those C's applied in the procedure. Second, no other conceptions of A beyond those C's proposed to account for your Q's, R's, and S's, and so forth, are regarded as relevant scientifically. They may remain suggestive. You don't get rid of them, but you don't regard them as relevant to science. Strict abduction does not permit the definition of A to range beyond whatever is minimally necessary for it to have its explanatory capacities. That strict control allows successful predictions to more impressively support the hypothesis. They just seem more credible. Four additional features. Third, due to this bounded clarity in your conception of A, a community of inquirers can apply A together and everyone can agree upon what the explanation is and what it so far entails. So this is important. Until strict abduction, you can't have a common community of inquirers who agree upon what is it is the hypothesis that's being investigated. Because all the previous simpler procedures allow A to be so vague that you could have multiple communities of inquirers or just big, big mush of speculation with all kinds of pseudosciences you know, sliding off of it. But not at strict abduction or the ones more complex. Fourth, although a community of inquirers will disagree amongst themselves over what new capacities A should have for increasing its predictive range, both the current definition of A and the presently assigned capacities place compatibility constraints on the sorts of new capacities that can be assigned to A. Fifth, if a new prediction goes badly, and boy it will, for every hypothesis, something's going to go wrong, so you got to kind of, right, the whole community's put on pause. But nevertheless, the community of inquirers only needs to seriously doubt the new implicated capacity of A, not the rest of the capacities of A, preserving whatever explanatory power A had already earned, at least temporarily. Now, it may end up you just discard A anyway because some other hypothesis is doing even better. But it, you can just sort of put things on pause. It means, unlike with Popper, you don't have to throw the whole thing out and start over, right? You can just save it, put it on the shelf, figure out what's going on. Sixth, the expansion of A's capacities and explanatory range can halt and pause whenever the community finds no further work in explaining phenomena to do presently, but A can be put to work again in the future when opportunities come, usually due to new exploratory technologies, new devices, new things that increase our uh, range of exploration, like the telescope, right, or the, or the, the satellite that can collect x-rays from the cosmos, right? So, uh, you know, we, we don't have to discard as unscientific hypotheses that had been pretty good, but we just don't know how to test anymore because we just don't have the technical power to do it. Well, you know, you just got to wait for the technology to, to expand, and that's okay. The community of inquirers can just put things on pause again. There are more complex kinds of procedural abduction, but they all share in these six features. Those features prevent a hypothesis from being able to explain far too much, which again, reduces credibility, and from explaining new phenomena only after they're observable, which again is too convenient, right? Exposing how a hypothesis really can't explain much at all. However, a hypothesis explaining too much too easily can still seem convincing and very realistic to the smartest minds. Volumes about 
the history of this or that scientific field are filled with examples of good scientists who stubbornly cling to poor hypotheses, right? So individually, you know, the smartest minds can, can sort of get stuck on, on things that uh, the community of inquirers later has to criticize. In modern science, however, only a community of inquirers consults together about how realistic a hypothesis should get, just as the community adds to the collection of evidence and contributes to the development of hypotheses. Now, I haven't said much about creativity just in this last part, so let's get back to creativity. But along the way, three modes of creativity have come up. Novelty, development, and organization, successive levels of complexity. Novelty could just be new things one after another. However, mere novelties may not be relevant to each other. Development, however, is the enlarging capacities to effectively manage sequenced novelties. However, independent developments are not automatically coordinated with each other. The highest level is what I'm going to call organization. The improving integration of the whole through harmonious co-development. However, only the committed community with a shared history and future can be responsible for this highest level of organization, which again is to say the improving integration of the whole through harmonious co-development. So let me use these concepts to make some general observations as I'm wrapping up here in the last couple of paragraphs. At the beginning of this paper, we asked, how is knowledge of the world created? It was proposed that what is learnable and what is logical is integrated and unified by creating new knowledge. This would require that discovery, which is not just about novelty, and justification are organically unified during the creation of knowledge. Procedural abduction at the level of strip, strict abduction and higher, I claim, integrates the learnable hypotheses under development and the logical quite thoroughly. This is where discovery and justification are functionally fused together within the organized process of procedural abduction. Procedural abduction yields discovery in its genuine sense of scientific realism. Knowledge creation in science is incompatible with positivism, instrumentalism, idealism, and any form of scientific irrealism. That's the point of abduction. These non-realisms that I just mentioned perpetuate the dualisms that block the way to comprehending scientific method and justification. Since learning and logic and discovery and justification are unified for the inclusive goal of knowledge creation, creativity could not be isolated from reasoning. Each finds its scientific purpose in the other. Creativity is reasonable and reasoning is creative where, right, where is this happening? Here, where an organization of scientists are growing organized knowledge. You cannot have one without the other. The body of knowledge requires the community of inquirers and vice versa in science. Finally, since knowledge of the real world is created, something really in this world accomplishes it. Again, to repeat, it's the community of inquirers. If they have a shared history of discovery and a shared future of hypothesis testing bound together by their common commitment to the purpose of creating knowledge. That's my conclusion. Thank you. All right. Thank you, John. First of all, great talk. Uh, yeah. It's good, right? Yeah. yeah. I know. Uh, abduction for me is one of Peirce's um, most rich and interesting concepts, and I loved your uh, systematic analysis of various different kinds. Uh, the relationship between deduction, abduction, induction. Great. Um, so I wanted to clarify one or two small things and then ask my question. So first of all, uh, because it wasn't quite clear to me uh, on the basis of the paper, do you think that all human creativity is abductive in structure? I have no idea. No idea. Okay. But at least scientific, <laughs> scientific. knowledge. <laughs> okay. That's the only claim you're making. I'm not trying to say anything about creativity in general. Okay. The, the paper's about scientific creativity. Right. So scientific creativity, specifically, 
Is I, it? I suspect that the answer is yes. You think to so? your question, Possibly. but I'm not. I haven't. Okay. All right. <laughs> Settle them. Then. Okay. So this is not philosophical anthropology. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, well, so we'll keep our it's, claims. It's scientific anthropology. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we'll keep our claims restricted for the meantime. Then. So. Okay. So. Uh, my question then is kind of on the difference you use for a lot of the paper the term discovery and there's at least when I'm hearing it there's a little bit of an equivocation between discovery and creativity because I'm trying to good figure out, okay good yeah go there well and I'm trying to pinpoint exactly how this works and uh, especially the offhand comment I liked that you made kind of about how for purse Perception is ultimately the only source of not new ideas. Oh, he repeatedly claims that, and he right. claims to have a proof of it. Right. And so Looks then good to me. I want either you to talk about Peirce or you to talk about your own opinion on this, because um, I'm interested in this idea, because you very rightly and very uh, eloquently point out how in deduction, you learn nothing new about the terms in induction, right? It's, the terms have to be accepted, and then nothing new is gained about uh, this term. Or in, in let, me, let me, if you go to the temporal version of induction, it is possible to gradually modify right. your conception in of terms. Right, in but induction. not for deduction, right? No, because then it's the fallacy of four terms. Right, exactly. And so uh, then in some forms of induction, and certainly in almost all forms of abduction, I imagine... The good ones, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's possible to create a new term oh uh not a brand new term well and you're so that's, modifying terms and so that's what got. i'm interested in is so when we say is it creativity or discovery because let's say for example you know whatever the proverbial apple falls on your head and you are newton and you abduce the concept of gravity or what have you right that's how creative is that really because the whole content of that new that concept gravity the only content of it is the observation of the world that ultimately re resides in perception. For Newton? I doubt it. <laughs> I don't know about Newton. But is that a creative moment, or is he just discovering something? I mean, does that term have a thickness to it? What is, what is he actually contributing beyond an observation through perception of the world? So is scientific knowledge creative in that kind of a thick sense? Or are all these terms that are either being modified or maybe newly created, if you will permit me to say that, through abduction, is there creativity let's, really let's happening Let's use Newton there? as an example. So for Newton, gravity is an attractive force, right? Right. Between objects with mass. Yeah. But he didn't use abduction to come up with his conception of force. Right. He modified right. prior notion of force force that he already had because, you know, he was of that century of science that had a conception of force. Now, where any conception of force comes ultimately, Peirce would say it comes from lived perceptual experience. Right. No abduction spontaneously created from nothing a concept of force. Right. And he's got a proof for this, and right. it's convincing. And so, right. so ultimately, you credit perception. But mere novelty is not the only form of creativity. Mm -hmm. There's development and yeah. right organization. So there's certainly a great deal of creativity involved with modifying prior held conceptions of whatever origin. right? And that's what science does. Mm -hmm. Science is not responsible for creating all original ideas of everything whatsoever. And good thing. Nothing to do that. <laughs> so perception gets the ultimate credit. But in science, creativity has to have a large measure of credit for two major things. Number one, modifying key terms as you go and modifying the conception of the object in the hypothesis. And as you can see uh, with abduction, you, with the more complicated, you're doing that together, sure. and that's the co-creativity that uh, I think procedural abduction takes advantage of, and that's what Peirce wanted. Right. So yeah. a term can be modified, but abduction is never going to create a term ex nihilo or something like that. that Only perception that could do yeah. that. Okay. <laughs> uh, somebody has to go there. One of the things I like about uh, about your schema here 
although I don't think it even begins to cover what Peirce thinks about the growth of scientific knowledge. But no, it's I'd a, agree with It's that. a piece of it. Uh, piece. One of the things I like about it is the way that archaeologists, beginning in about the 1950s, started leaving much of a site unexcavated mm -hmm. under the assumption that future scientists would have better uh, better methods, <laughs> better tools, um, uh, and, and a broader perspective. In other words, more pieces are likely to come together. And so for the last 70 years or so, archaeologists, instead of fully excavating a site, well, intentionally, I mean, uh, Frijole Canyon in, uh, in, uh, in New Mexico is an example of that. Um, <clears throat> they intentionally, they could excavate it all now, but they know that future scientists will have better tools a broader perspective and an improved method, and that's, exactly, and that's so. So I think you've got that. Here's what I think uh, is the question that you have to, you, you also have to answer, and you may have an answer for it. But <clears throat> remember that Peirce says that um, the chances of landing on a, a hypothesis that's fruitful um, from nowhere, and this picks up on. Uh, uh, Jared's question is is not only zero, but zero reduced by infinity because infinitely many explanations would be compatible with any observation, and so uh, and so and the chances of getting a second one that builds on the first one, you can see zero reduced by infinity reduced by infinity, um, uh, and, and and yet. There is scientific knowledge. Uh, and so the realism is in trouble here, as he knows, because he has to come up with some theory of mind that's embedded in and, and, and crazily likely to land on the right hypothesis. I mean, that's just crazily likely. Uh, and, of course, he struggles with this. But the growth of scientific knowledge also depends. It's not just, I mean, the abduction has a ground somewhere. And when you said, and I laughed and I nodded, it, it could be out of this world. Uh, in, the, in the sense that uh, he doesn't profess to know, but, it, but he can say, well, there's, there's mind <laughs> with a great big M. Uh, capital M, there is mind. Uh, and what we have is minds. <laughs> right? and, and within within mind, there is minds. Uh, uh, and, and I have one. And that's why I can abduce sure. the first hypothesis and then against infinity a second and a third and eventually end up with um, with, what is it, abductively ab no, abductively Abductively abduced ab abduction? No, there was deducibly abductive. abductive. Yeah, yeah, deducibly abductive uh, abductions. And I'm just warming up. At that yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, this looks a lot like the way Peirce thinks, but but I mean, you still where where do you stand on mind with a capital M relative to what you put? Because you can say, oh, I don't know where creativity comes from, but I'm sorry, you just gave a theory of abduction. You have to answer this question. Okay, so like let me give some leading indicators, and I'm going to draw a little bit on Dewey as well, but it's probably in purse too. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, I'm just at this point trying to link up scientific creativity with the realistic credibility that gradually grows, right? This is scientific realism. Sure. It's not philosophical realism, it's scientific mm -hmm. realism. And it suffers from all of our cognitive biases and defects, but that's why being an inter a co-interpreter within a community of inquirers is so much fun. Mm -hmm. But it's inherently conservative in the sense that you only advance incrementally insofar as your field of observables goes going forward. Because you can't but see things that are radically see, outside of that. You can't see them, yeah. so you're not going to worry about it. Yeah, yeah. But look back into the past and this is a Deweyan theme. Science didn't just emerge full-blown from Athena's head or, you know, Thales or something, right? It's continuous with our ordinary capacities to do ordinary sort of forensic inquiries into berries and fruits and birds and the skies, and, right? Now, that's more fallible even than science is, but it's not stupid. 
In other words, if the origins of our basic conceptions of patterns, causality, and these sorts of things obviously work pretty good for middle-sized creatures like us in the middle-sized environment that we've got to deal with, then as we gradually refine our procedures of scientific inquiry, they're not so radically different with what has already worked pretty well. So there's a lot of continuity. The price you pay for that continuity is, of course, nature in fine grain, in ultimate laws, whatever those are, could be radically different from what we... And that may be. But notice, even something like non-classical physics, right? Quantum mechanics, for example. There are still continuities. Mm -hmm. There are still continuities between the classical and the quantum world. It's just false to say that they're two radically different uh, uh, pictures of the world. They aren't that radically different. Furthermore, our scientific instruments easily glide. There's no chasm there in the phenomenon. So at any rate, um, it's, it, it's that conservatism, again, that I think actually helps the natural realistic attitude that we have. Could ultimately all of our big theories be wrong? Well, sure, but that's not a philosophical reason to jump to irrealism, because the only reason why we learn that hypothesis A isn't so great is because we have greater realistic commitment to hypothesis B. That's an optimistic philosophical induction not a pessimistic induction. The body of knowledge is growing. Is any individual hypothesis fallible? Any big paradigm replaceable? Of course, but not because of a loss of confidence in scientific realism, because of a growing confidence in scientific realism. So you have to have the best of both worlds. The community of inquirers has to be both cautiously pessimistic but cautiously optimistic and that's just the deal with human knowledge in general and you're just you know uh, holding it to higher standards than that I think is 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 foolishness uh, you don't need Platonism or dualism I think to explain that sort of cautious conservative optimism of what communities of inquirers really do when they try to uh, you know um, uh, use the best of our cognitive abilities while not letting our cognitive biases overwhelm us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a good answer. Oh, cool. Uh, I saw all three hands at once, so we'll go in a line. All right. Uh, John, what about puberty? I asked because you seem to be committed to security and do a great job of explaining that element in scientific creativity, but I think also, there's an important artistic element. And first thought so, too. He has some interesting lies there to say, for example, that artists are better, obser are better observers than scientists, except for the special minutia that scientists are sometimes looking for. Um, so what about uberty? Isn't that important to scientific creativity? And it's not just a... Oh, I have the right slide up. The answer's on the slide. <laughs> OK. Mm -hmm. uh, look at, look at uh, line three. Right? Suppose only if A has C1 to 2, then Qs are not. That is an aesthetic accomplishment to a large degree. I mean, it's the modification of the situation given your logical tools and the phenomena you're trying to anticipate. Right? So there, there's a, 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 a fresh wholeness that you're. you're uh, so projecting, you're imagining. There's there's a, a, a form of aesthetic imagination there, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So, but I wonder if that's really fresh, or is it a conservative refinement? So, <laughs> the, and, I, and I bring this up. I mean, what do you need? What do you need? What do you need? What what work is the word fresh doing? Yeah. Well, Where, well, what do you? What what does that mean? Example. So, so, I, so Newton is talking, we've been talking about gravity, so Newton talks about gravity as, as attraction at a distance, and, and then Einstein says gravity is the curvature of space-time. It's sure. like, whoa, what is that? Where did that come from? That's not just like, let's add two to C1. You know, that's, that's, a, that's rich suggestiveness being introduced in an Ubericious moment. Yeah, not really. Ubericious. <laughs> no, it isn't. It isn't that fresh. No, Einstein just came from different 
theoretical grounds largely than from what Newton did. You just New, you know you just can't graft Einstein directly from Newton. There's so much more that Einstein is trying to deal with, explain, and assume. Right? Newton didn't have to deal with Hertz or electromagnetic radiation or anything like that. So, uh, right. so keep in mind that a community of inquirers across decades and especially centuries is dealing with multiple trunks of trees competing with each other, right? And, and now you're in the realm of uh, uh, looking at different paradigms. Um, so uh, I think there's plenty of continuities with where Einstein was coming from. It wasn't that radical. In fact, in fact, I think in many ways it was more conservative than what Newton was doing, given the the background of late nineteenth century science that sci that uh, Einstein was trying to explain. We're already over, so but we have some time. So is it okay? Yeah, yeah. I was about to say, uh, there's there's a little bit of time. So let's yeah. go on and finish the the two more right. questions. Okay. So, uh, well, actually, I have two questions, but and the first one here is, is, is uh, mostly clarification. Right. Uh, you uh, said early on in response that uh, you are confining your realism or this, this picture of abduction only to, well, only to scientific abduction. The realism is, uh, is applicable only to scientific abduction. And I'm wondering... For the purposes of this paper. For the purpose, okay. Well, my question was, uh, how extensive is your sense of science here? Does it extend to the normative sciences? Give me an example of a normative logic. science. Logic. Yeah, logic. yeah that's right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, here, the combination of deduction, induction, and abduction in science is used for the purpose of hypothesizing real things in space-time, nature. So this is the logic right. of the science. This isn't. This isn't yeah. going to get you to Platonism or you know any anything else. It's, you know. These are entities that are doing stuff to you. This is the realm of existence, not reality. Mm -hmm. If that helps. <laughs> now, could this be applicable in ethics? I think this works for social facts as well as, as, well as natural facts. But that's another body of work that I'm working on. But this will work for social facts. I mean, not just social psychology and the behavioral sciences. I mean, it'll work for ethics. And I, I think Dewey believed it. This is, for example, this is a crude way of thinking about dramatic rehearsal in the realm of interpersonal events. I would say dramatic rehearsal is a crude example of thinking like this. <laughs> the Point taken. <laughs> The, the other uh, question, more in the way of a suggestion, uh, is one respect in which you might enrich this picture so as to perhaps uh, encompass more of scientific reasoning is also not only to consider just the consequences of A, but also adding on the consequences of not A. Uh, and, and that's where you get for it. Well, yeah, with this, this stuff, you don't get the, the competition aspect of it. Mm -hmm. I actually think I think not A is in there. Is in the only. If? Yeah, it's in the yeah, only was, if. <laughs> that's it's, it. It's, yeah. It, it, it's, it that, and by like the way, that only if is a rhetorical trick. In addition to <laughs> to containing a negation, uh, it, it it invites uninformed people to think of A as the antecedent. Uh, uh, I mean, not not you, Dave, but people. I mean, it feels like an antecedent, even though we all know it's a consequent, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and so there's a rhetorical, and actually I approve of the rhetorical trick, the reason being that it's easier to think it yeah, yeah. the way you put it up there than, than it would be if you had gone, suppose, if A, then, uh, I mean, if C1, then A. Yeah. Because then it looks like you're building the antecedent, which you are, and C means conditions or something like it, but then what happens is you're off into, you're off into the world of... Uh, of um, um, uh, a, a bad formal logic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah. Uh, yes, I really enjoyed the talk. Uh, I thought the strongest part of the talk related to this is a creativity conference. Creativity actually happens, I believe, through community. Mm -hmm. Especially community mm -hmm. of inquirers. That's so I believe my that, conclusion, yeah. Right, and so I believe that... Um, 
so many of us have been lied to, and these aren't Plato's noble lies, they're more like ignoble lies, because we've been fed that science comes through this kind of cult of genius. I mean, come on, there's really no uh, Harvey without Robert Hooke, there's really no Newton without Leibniz, and Newton was so broke that Edmund Haley had to publish his Principia. Uh, I mean, the creative uh, community uh, sense has been lost in a lot of ways because of this emphasis on genius, uh, because of this emphasis on uh, the cult of the individual, almost a kind of scientific uh, heroism in the sense of Thomas Carlyle. So if you could just emphasize here, is Peirce really getting at a kind of divi creative individuality? Because that's how I'm seeing, what I'm seeing in your schema is how creativity is not only cut in many ways, but so is science. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. Yeah, I think that's exactly what Scientists Peirce is going with that. Scientists are individuals. Yes. They're not individuals, they're individuals. No scientist accomplishes anything by his or herself. Yeah, and I just... You, you know, isolate a no scientist you and Galen, the you get a position. lot of dumb. There's no dumb. Galen without his gladiators, without well, sure. Hippocrates. There's just yeah. so many factors and forces. There's no Einstein without Max Planck. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go on and on. It's mm -hmm. community effort. It's uh, science as team training. <laughs> it's kind of what I got out of your talk in so many ways. So. There's no first without Chauncey Wright. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So we're gonna take a, we're gonna take a break here. I'm gonna order pizza. So before everybody, uh, before oh, let's thank John. Yeah. yeah.